good to have everyone this morning. Uh, summertime's getting here, have y'all noticed? It's looking good outside. It makes people want to be out and doing many, many things. But another thing about summertime coming is we have vacation Bible school coming. I shared with the men a while ago, folks, this, this is about as grown up as it gets. It's not just for kids. It's for the kingdom of God. Amen? Uh, the Southern Baptist worshipers of Jesus Christ. And, and I, I call it that because there are many other worshipers of Jesus Christ. But in the United States, it's the second largest group uh, of people who worship under a, a particular name, the, the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Everyone who calls on the name of Jesus as their Lord and believes in their heart, God raised them from the dead, are my brothers and sisters in Christ because the Bible says that they're saved. And so that's not that issue. But the second largest group of worshipers, uh, when, when you go look at their, their mission, and the mission is to help more people get to heaven, like we sang about a while ago, the, the biggest mission is to be sure that not just the temporary things of this earth are there and important, but the eternal things. We want to make an eternal difference in people's lives. And the time of the year that the, that group is the most effective is vacation Bible school. So is that just kids? Is that just daycare? No, it makes an eternal difference. There are some adults here today because of vacation Bible school. Maybe when you were small. Maybe your children. Maybe someone else. But, but it's, a, it's a huge thing that, that happens. And God gives us that opportunity. Now, who doesn't want to see more people eternally in heaven with, with our Lord? The enemy. So when will he come out and fight the hearts? When? We're at the time of our greatest success. And he's going to come out and he's going to do everything that he can to stop that. And so I asked the men, and I asked you, and we have it on the, on the announcements up there, pray. Prayer is our artillery, our loving artillery to make the enemy put his head down so we can rescue kids from their eternal destiny of being away from Christ. Amen? We want to rescue them. And, and, and in that way, we're following our rescuer, and what's his name? Jesus. Jesus. That's his name? He's our rescuer. He's our Savior. He's the one that came for us. And so be in prayer for that. I want us to, to remember what our, our job is because we, we forget. Uh, we forget sometimes what, what church is about. But what is church for? We, we've got some things on the wall over there right as you go out the door. Three reasons why we want to come to church. One is to exalt the Savior, put Him back where He needs to be in our life. We call Him Lord, which is our utmost authority. But how many times does other things take over? Have you ever let worry become more powerful in your life than your Lord? I'm talking about in your mind. He, he's always the most powerful. Have you ever let that happen? I've let that happen way too many times. Have you ever let your job become more powerful in your life than your Lord, who we call our Lord? Absolutely. Have you ever let troubles between you and someone you love become more important in your life than your Lord? Absolutely. It happens, doesn't it? This is life. We're not in heaven yet, and those things are going to happen. How many times do we need to get back and say, wait a minute, the Lord is my shepherd, not these worries, not these temporary troubles. The Lord is the one who's going to lead me. And so we come back to church and we, and we get our, our priorities back straight. We remember, wait a minute, I have victory in Jesus and he's my Lord. So we need to exalt the Savior. We need to put him back where he needs to be in life. Then how will we treat our people around us, our, our, our spouses and our kids and our friends and even our enemies? We treat them the way that he asked us to in love and respect and, and hold them to a very high place. Amen? Then the second thing is to get equipped. If you were here last week for Mother's Day, I wanted to be sure we were equipped. I'm not going to say moms because I'm not a mom. But, but moms and, and parents to equip to tell our kids how to be in heaven for eternity. And we went through what the Bible says about what it takes and we wound up with Romans 10, 9. Confess with your mouth. Individually, said he is your Lord, your ultimate authority. Believe in your heart and who you are that he was raised from the dead. And the Bible says on this plaque, we brought it down, we put it on the wall. It says you will be saved. Whether you're in this group of worshipers like the Southern Baptists or this group over here or that group, if Jesus is Lord of your life and you meant it in your heart, not just lip service, you will be saved. Amen? Okay. With all of that said, well, one more thing. Once we're saved, we have something to do. Once we have the equipping, we need to go tell other people how to get there. 
you know, after you've been there a million years or so, you're probably going to have met everybody there, right? Wouldn't it be great to have more people there than that? Remember, he died, and then he wants who to be saved? All. And he, did. he sent an army out to reach them. An army with different kinds of weapons, and it's called his church. And so the last thing it says, the reason we come here, is to evangelize. That means to go tell people how to get to heaven. Go tell people how to miss hell and hit heaven. Amen? So that's our three purposes. Put Jesus first in our life. Get equipped with his word and his spirit. And then go out and tell more people how to get to heaven. And you know people have a problem with that? Have you noticed that? People get upset when you start talking about Jesus. Unless you're using the cuss word or something like that. Then they don't mind. But it's really strange. Have you noticed that? Why is that? No, because I'm a liar whispering in their ears. The Bible says that the enemy, the devil, is a liar. And he comes to kill and destroy. And he wants to destroy your witness. That's why we just prayed in that song. God, give us clean hands. Because guess what they'll do? If they ever see you do something wrong, they doesn't line up with God's word. They'll say, can't listen to them. Can't listen to them. See, they don't even follow it yourselves. That's what, that's what they're going to say. That's what the enemy's going to whisper in their ears. And you know what? When he blinds them, we, our new word for today was beguiles them, cons them, however you want to say it. Then he keeps them with him. And that's a scary place to be. With all that said, let's look at the church and see what God has, has given to the church, equipping the church. Look what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting verse 4. I put it in, in, in the New Living Translation, the modern English translation of the Bible, because I, I don't want us to miss any of this. You can check it out with, with any other version, the legitimate version you got, and it's going to say the same thing, but I don't want us to miss what it says. It says, Paul speaking, I always thank my God for you. He's talking to a church. He says he thanks God for his brothers and sisters in Christ. And the gracious gifts he has given you. Gracious means they didn't come because we earned them. Because of how good we were. They came by his grace. What's grace? Undeserved gifts. Undeserved favor. He says God gave his church undeserved gifts. And look what they are. He says he has given you. Talking to his church. Now that you belong to Jesus Christ. What happens when you belong to Jesus Christ? The Bible says when you believed, when you made him your Lord, when you believed, his Holy Spirit came to dwell in you. And he brought gifts. And he gave you different things than probably the person sitting next to you. So that you were specialist in this area. The person sitting next to you is a specialist in this area. The person sitting over there is a specialist in this area. And so on and so forth. And when we all get together... I hope there ought a song about that. When we all get to heaven, when we all get together, there ought to be a song about that. Then, then we have these gifts of God and we start looking more like the fullness of who God is. And he does that to make us interdependent. He said, you remember, you can take all the laws in the Bible and, and they all sum up to loving God and loving each other. Did you remember reading that? As ourselves, loving each other as ourselves. And so he says, for Satan, I get together because when you get together, you bring all these gifts, all this equipping, and we have more of the fullness of God showing. And so hopefully more people are going to listen and see what God looks like in his character. Okay, see what he looks like in his character and in his power. Because you have got gifts from God. So they're supernatural gifts. So you got these gracious gifts now that you belong to Jesus Christ. When do you give? Them? When you belong to Jesus Christ. Okay, that's what the church has. So let's pray and, and talk about this equipping that God's given us. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us and thank you for this amazing equipment, Lord, that many of us go through life either ignoring or being ignorant of. Father, your Bible says that you don't want us to be ignorant and you don't want us to be powerless. You don't want us to live in defeat. And Lord, you don't want us to live useless lives or unfulfilling lives. You want us to have life and life abundant. So Father, I pray that we all look at your word today. Lord, and we, and we grasp this, this opportunity to love, Father, in your name, in your character, and in your power. I pray, Father, that, that we don't let the enemy win, no matter where he is or who he's using or misusing, Father, that we carry on, Lord, your standard, your flag, your message. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. He says, I always thank my God for you and the, and the, the gracious gifts, these, these, these uh, spiritual gifts that he's given you now that you belong to Christ Jesus. 
through him, through Jesus, God has enriched your church. God brought all these gifts with all these different people. He's enriched your church. Listen, in how many ways? Well, just in a couple ways. Your church has only got this much, but that big church over there, they got a whole lot more. Is that what it says on that verse up there? He's enriched it how? And in how many ways? How many ways? Every way. In other words, this church is equipped. We've got the equipment. Okay? Now, if you've got the equipment, uh, I remember uh, my sister, I don't know if she'll watch this sermon on, on, the, on the YouTube or not, but anyway, I remember my sister writing, a, uh, she, she made pretty good grades in school, she was in college and she had to write a paper on how to do something. So she, she wrote a paper on how to change a flat. And she knew. She was raised in the country and we had lots of flats. She didn't exactly know what you called the different things, though. So she, she said, you pulled those lubes with a lube wrench. Okay? And she had her lube wrench right there. Okay? And so she was equipped and she knew how to use it. But there are many people that have, it's not a lube wrench, it's a lug wrench, for those that didn't know. Uh, but you know what? She, she could make it work. Anyway... Did you know there are a lot of cars who come equipped with lug wrenches and a lot of people that don't know how to use them? And so they sit there and they say, I've got a flat. Now, have y'all seen a little guy go commercial and then the little guy's there and, oh, no, I have a flat. And he gets all upset. He gets very emotional about it. You know, churches are that way. We've got the equipment. What happens if we don't use it? What happens to the car sitting on a flat? It doesn't go as fast as one that's not. Right? It, it doesn't act like it was built to act. It doesn't do what it's supposed to. What if a church has the equipment and doesn't use it? What if we've got this resource and we don't use it? And then so he, he says, your church, your church is equipped, enriched in every way with all the eloquent words and, and all of your knowledge. How many people think that they're not smart enough for God to use them? That's a lie from the enemy. That's a lie from the enemy. Did you know that? Chances are you're going to find people too smart. That God won't be able to use them because they won't listen to God. They rely on their own intellect. Right? That's kind of like a piece of clay dough. And, and you take the clay dough out of the can, you know, before it gets over crumply, while it's still pliable, and you make a little stick figure, you put it there, and then it sits there and says, you know... I don't like the way the boss made me. I don't think he knows what he's doing. Right? Now, if you were the creator of that Play-Doh man, he starts talking to you that way, what would you do with him? Back in the can. <laughs> right? What happens when we get smarter than our creator? We, <laughs> you know what? God in His grace gives us more time outside the can. The school of hard knocks. The school of, of, of looking at, at all the wonderful things He's given us. The opportunities He gives us and then He gives us again and then He gives us again. Is our God patient? Does our God suffer long for our opportunity to understand Him and to love Him? And it's not a matter of intellect. You can be very intelligent and be extremely unwise. Remember the difference between intelligence and wisdom? Intelligence, you can have a lot of facts and you can regurgitate them. Wisdom is making right decisions. Wisdom is making right decisions. So he waits. The Bible says, begin to wisdom is the fear of the Lord. The respect in the one who created us. Okay? So anyway, I like said, you've got that. Don't tell God he didn't make you right. He not only made you right, he said, you've got the equipment, here's how you use it. And he gave us a manual. Amen? An Emmanuel. Is God with us? But He gave us a manual called the Bible. What is it? Basic instructions before leaving earth. This is what some people term that. The manual of, of how to use the gifts He gave. Now, many people might take that loop wrench, and when their car has a flat, take it and start beating the hood and say, You worthless car. And, and what good is that going to do? It's going to make some body shop richer. But it's not going to get you quicker to your destination, and it's not going to help. And many people will take what God's given them and say, well, I don't need this, and they'll start using it their own way. And what happens? 
It doesn't work anymore. It doesn't work like it was planned. And then they say, God did this to me. I gave instructions. I love you. There it is. By the way, did he just give you a couple of little clues? Or did he, did he put a whole bunch of stuff in there? That's a pretty complete manual, wouldn't you say? It takes a while to read the thing. It takes a lifetime to start appreciating everything that's in there. Anyway, verse 6 says, this confirms that what I told you about Christ is true. Paul went to this place. Corinth, you'd have to know about Corinth. Corinth was on an isthmus. You have to have a lisp to talk like that. But it's on an isthmus. What's an isthmus? It's a narrow strip of land between two bodies of water. Okay? This isthmus was about, let, let's just talk about narrow strip of land. This narrow strip of land was about, I think, six miles wide. And, and they didn't like going through the sea back then. Because bad stuff happened out in the ocean. Many times they just called it the abyss when they talked about the ocean. A scary place to go. And it was a hundred and something miles around the peninsula to come back to the other side. And so what they would do was they would stop their ships. And they would drag them the six miles to the other side instead of going out to that abyss and coming around. Lots of shipwrecks. Paul was shipwrecked three or four times. You know, lots of shipwrecks. Meanwhile, the guys who weren't dragging the ships, because they had professional ship draggers there, they were on shore leave. And they all went to church. Do you believe that? This was, this was a sailor's town. In fact, the, 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 the pagan places of the day, the churches they had had temple prostitutes that the men could go to and act like they were worshiping the false god. I mean, that's, that's how this was a bad place. And Paul went there, and he starts telling the good news about Jesus Christ. And you know, some listened. Enough listened, and they got together, and they started worshiping Jesus. And those are the ones he's talking to, to the church in that place. Did you know that everybody in Roanoke and the town you're from, we have Lacassine, we have uh, Jennings and Welch and all these other places. Did you know there's people sitting in their house sleeping this morning? Even though there's churches all over the place, did you know that they're, they're there? Not everybody appreciates the goodness of our God. Did you know that? How many of us, it took us a while for us to start getting Get my hand up high. Absolutely. And somehow, with the help of God and His equipment, we want to tell Him how to do that. He says, this confirms what I told you about Christ is true. He said, I told you what it took to go to heaven. It's Jesus. I told you that when you got Jesus, His Holy Spirit would come reside in you and help you become more like Him and help you reach more people. He says, this confirms all of that. Verse 7 says, now you have every spiritual gift you need. You have a few of the spiritual gifts you need. Is that what it says? How many do you have? Every one. Equipped. Got your loot wrench. Everything it takes to jack that car up and get the lugs off of it and all that. So you've got it all. You, you can make this thing work. Now you have every spiritual gift you need as you eagerly wait for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to come back one day according to the manual. Amen? And when he comes back and he gets through with judgment after everybody's had an opportunity to hear the good news, when he gets back, he's going to do away with the old one. How many of you have a car that you're happy that one day you're going to do away with and get a new one? He, he says our, our bodies are kind of that way. How many of us have a body that we're going to be happy to get rid of this old one and get a new one that's going to last forever? Don't look at your neighbor and then say, boy, I know you'll be glad. Don't, don't do that. Okay? But, but one day that's going to happen. I said, don't do that. That section of their prey fall. <laughs> They're well equipped. But what's the problem with freedoms? <laughs> Our most dangerous thing that I do, the most dangerous thing I have is a free will. Did you know that? I can use that lug wrench right or I can use it wrong. It's not that I don't have it. Right? Anyway, is it okay to have a good time while we're worshiping God? Why not? We, we're sharing good news, amen? We're sharing great news. Okay? It says, you have every spiritual gift you need as you eagerly wait. Now remember, he's coming back, and when he gets back, and he's given everybody the opportunity to do what he says or not. Let me tell you something. Jesus didn't 
come to limit your choices. He gave, came to give you better choices. How many heard he came to tell me exactly what to do and all that kind of stuff and I can't have freedom and all that kind of stuff? He didn't come to limit your choices. He came to give you better choices. And then you can act with wisdom or not. It's still your choice. Amen? But he does tell you the consequences of the choices. And, and when he comes back, he's going to take his church, his army, also known as his bride, also known as his ambassadors. He's going to take his church, known as his body, his physical representation to the rest of the world, his body. And he's going to take them out and he's going to build another one. Heaven and an earth. The only thing left of the old one, according to the manual, is the church. So we eagerly await because all of the sin, all the bad stuff, all of, even the bad stuff my body wants to do that's wrong, that Daryl's brain, broken brain, wants to do that's wrong, that'll go away too. That's what the Bible teaches, okay? So that's going to happen. So we eagerly wait for that to happen. Why do bad things happen to good people? We're not in heaven yet. We're still in the old heaven, in the old earth. We're not there yet. Verse 8 says, He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be free from all blame on that day when our Lord Jesus returns. Wow! He's going to help us till that day. Now, now I'm going to tell you, if I let my worry be my Lord, I'm not going to enjoy it. If I let my strife be my Lord, I'm not going to enjoy it. If I let what happened at work be my Lord, I'm not going to enjoy it. But if I let my Lord be my Lord, He's bigger than my words. He can support me better than my job. He can help me in my relationships. Amen? You see the difference? That's why it's so important to have Him first. He will keep you strong if we what? Hold on to Him. Stay in relationship with Him. Keep checking the manual. Keep talking to him. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be free of all blame when the Lord Jesus, our Lord Jesus returns. In other words, when he gets there, say, enemy, by the way, Satan or, or Hasatan means the accuser. Did you know that? He'll say, Daryl, I know what you was thinking last night when that movie came on and that picture flashed up. I know what you think. Jesus, this is what he was thinking. He's the accuser. And you know what? My brain is broke. And, and thankfully, the man who tells me what to do when a bad thought comes in, says, take it, give it to Jesus. Take it, cap, say, Jesus, that came in my brain. I don't want to think that way. I don't want to think about some other woman the way that I only really want to think about my wife. Amen? Some other man's daughter. I don't want to think about the way I should only think about my wife. And so I take that to Jesus, and he helps what? Get my brain going the right direction and thinking those things. You see the difference? Okay? So he can keep us strong until he returns. God will do this. Does God lie? No, he don't lie. God will do this. He is faithful. Did you know ever since I've come here, he's never missed a Sunday? Did you know that? The Bible says we're two or more again in his name, he's present. He is so faithful. I wish I were faithful in that way. The problem with his bride, his church, including this part of his church, is we're fickle. One minute we close and we want to do it his way, the next minute we start what? Slipping away. We let our emotions take us away. We let other things take us away. We let our grief, we let our, let our, our whatever is going on in our head take us away. We let our complacency take us away. All those kind of things. But our God is faithful. Isn't it great that in that union, the groom, Jesus Christ, his bride, the church, one of them is absolutely faithful. And what does he say he's going to do? He's going to keep us strong till that day. He is faithful to do what he says. He invited you into partnership with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The body of Christ. Our Lord is our partner. Isn't that cool? Our Lord, ultimate authority, is our partner. We make ourselves slaves. He says, no, get up here. You're my friend. That's what the Bible teaches. So it's not that that situation that, that you know, we think boss, uh, a slave relationship and all that other guy. That's not what he's talking about. He says, you got it? Let's go do it. Okay? 
So Paul says, I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I'm not speaking my own. By the way, if Darrell says it, and if you can't find it in the manual, it's subject to doubt. Okay? Let's get that straight right up front. If any man says it, and you can't find it backed up in the manual, and I mean backed up in context the way that it should be read, it's subject to doubt. All right? He said, I'm speaking to you in the, under the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. So if Darrell says if it's out of here, it's under the authority of who? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. The Bible says this is God breathes. Okay? And, and you can use it that way. So I'm speaking to you, he, he says, by the authority of our Jesus Christ. This is what he says to do. This is equipping. It's available. It's in the trunk. You can change your tire with it. Okay? I'm just saying the equipment is there to do what? Live in harmony. To live in harmony. What does that mean? What he's been saying over and over. He puts up with us when we mess up. We're supposed to put up with each other when we mess up. That's what patience is called. Did you know that? It's forgiveness. You say, wait a minute. I've got people that don't deserve forgiveness. Neither did I. <clears throat> Neither did you. What does grace mean? Undeserved. The fact that I'm forgiven of my sin is not that I deserve it or I work for it or I'm smarter or dumber or whatever else. It's what? Grace given by God. And so we can choose to live in a harmonious way. You say, Brother Darrell, you're not that harmonious for her office. <laughs> You're right, I got a long way to go. Got a long way to go in doing what? Learning to not let the things of this world take away my mission as part of the bride and ambassadorship from the kingdom of God. So I need a support group. I need Christ with me. I need His Spirit to keep reminding me. Okay? How important is this? This, this unity of the body of Christ. How important is this? I used to tell people when we were trying to build this building that, you know, if the church votes to build this thing out of cardboard instead of metal, and it votes 80, 90 percent to do it that way, I'll join them. You know why? When it rains, what's going to happen if we build this thing out of cardboard? This building is going to fall down. But we went as a group, 80, 90 percent, you're never seldom going to get 100 percent. But we went as a group, and what do we still have even though the building is down around our, 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 our ankles? We still have a church, because what is a church? That's a group of believers. We say, well, that didn't work. <laughs> Let's go back and try it again. Can you miss God sometimes? Yes. Absolutely. But you can still be what? The church. Amen? Or we could say, well, 49 want to build it out of uh, 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 cardboard, but 51 want to build it out of metal. Well, obviously, the metal people are right. Obviously, let's just go with them. All of a sudden, we've got what? We've got a building that's half empty. Amen? What happened to half of our brothers and sisters? We weren't ready to make a move there, were we? Because it did what? Was it harmonious? It was divided. Okay? So when it comes time to tell the lost and dying world, y'all need to come see what we've got. Y'all can't even get along with yourselves. <laughs> Why do we want to go with y'all? Do you see how that happens? So everything that we had done before means nothing if we don't show it and live it. And you don't have to be correct in worldly ways to live in love the way God wants us to. I'll give you an example. Y'all came for that, right? Actually, it's in the Bible. Listen to what it says. I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church, rather be of one mind. Whose mind? Jesus' mind. Untied in thought, oh, excuse me, united in thought and purpose. Okay. My tongue was still tied. It was being untied. Anyway, let me ask you something. Were things going wrong in the day Jesus was there? The, the Holy Land was being run by a bunch of Gentile conquerors called Romans. One out of every three people was a slave. Women were being treated as property. So Jesus went in there and he, he, he got mad. He went and told them 
the Romans to get out of there. He said, slavery ends now. He says, women, uh, they, later in the book of Galatians, he says, slave or free, and they're the same to me. Male or female, they're the same to me. I died for all of them. But is that what he went around telling everybody? We're going to get these social justices right. Is that what he said his main reason for being there was? That's not what he went and did. Because that was temporary. He went in there to do what? Fix the eternal problem. Amen? And the enemy would love for us to get sidetracked. It's not that we don't do what we can for things that are wrong. But we need to focus on the most important thing. And that's eternal issues. Amen? That would love us to be sidetracked. He, he would love for that to, to happen. Just, y'all work on those temporary things. Y'all just keep that up. Because then when he goes down, he says, boy, I, I robbed God of all those others that would have brought him such great joy. Now, he doesn't get any benefit out of it except that moment of saying, I robbed God of all those people. He says, listen to what happened. For some members of Chloe's household have told me about your quarrels, my dear brothers and sisters. Let me ask you something. If something goes wrong in our relationships in this church, what do people talk about it? Chloe's household will. They did, didn't they? Is it obvious? The enemy wants us to fall. Has he got people that will, will go and tell people what's going wrong? Absolutely it's obvious. And somebody will tell, and we lose our witness. And look what, what it was about. Some of you are saying, I'm a follower of Paul. And others say, well, I follow Apollos. And others say, no, I follow Peter. And others say, no, I follow Jesus. What are they doing? They're playing the old game of my dog's bigger than your dog. That's what we said more of our fish. <laughs> and we start doing what? Talking about pride. Talking about why I'm better than you. Isn't that what it's doing? Who's laughing and rubbing his hands when people start dividing up that way? God's people start dividing up that way. Who's laughing and rubbing his hands? The enemy. The enemy. Now listen, have they done things right up to that point? Have they accepted Jesus as their Lord? Yes. Did they have the gifts and the equipment that God wanted them to have? Yes. Right? Did they have teachers that God sent to help them and to understand better about this? Remember, this wasn't completely written back then. Back very little of the New Testament was written back then. Did he have people to come in and explain it to him? Yes. They had it all right there. And then what did they do with it once they got it? Started picking sides. Started saying, this is more right than this. I'm more right than you. And all that kind of stuff. That didn't happen in the Christian world today. It does. Who wins? Actually, nobody. But Satan ain't going to win. But he thinks he is. He plays that stupid game, that destructive, that horrible game. And he asks, has Christ been divided into factions? When we get to heaven, is there going to be a section for these Southern Baptists, these Catholics, these Pentecost? You go over here, you go over there, you go over there. Is that how it's going to be? No, it's only going to be a place for the children of God. Amen? Those who have made Jesus the Lord of their life and are following Him. That's what it's for. He says, has Christ been divided? He says, well, not Paul. Somebody says, hey, I follow Paul. He says, was I the one crucified for you? If he had died on the cross for him, would it have done any good? Was he the, the, the literal son of God who, who was a perfect substitute for us who could take our penalty and then be raised from the dead that way? He was not. Was he perfect and never sinned? We know Paul sinned. Amen. In fact, the Bible said, we brought it out front last week, everybody is sinned and comes short of the glory of God except for the God-man, Jesus Christ. Fully God, fully man. He says, I didn't do that for you. He says, I thank God I didn't baptize any of you except a, a couple. He says, because I don't want anybody to go out and say, well, I'm better than you because I was baptized in Paul's name. What name were we baptized in? Jesus said, go out and be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which is one God. Only God can do that. But it's one God, right? And without Jesus, it wouldn't work. He said, yeah, I'll baptize a couple more, but I don't remember baptizing anybody else because it wasn't what it was about. For Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach. Somebody else had the gift of pastoring the people who said, I'm all in for Jesus. We're going to stay here and do this. Paul says, great, you got the message. I'm going to go tell somebody else. He was an evangelist. 
He was moving on. He said, somebody else is going to stay here and help that church organize. Somebody who's gifted to do that and help you use your gift to, to just bring honor and glory to God. <coughs> okay? He said, that wasn't my job. The church is made up of many with specialized gifts in their area. He says, when I came to preach the good news, I'm not going to do with clever speech. I'm not going to trick you. I'm not going to say, you deserve a break today, so get up and get away. Come on over here to First Baptist whatever. That's an old commercial. How many of y'all remember that from McDonald's? I know some of you are too young. I see you shaking your head. Okay? I'm not going to use cliches. I'm not going to twist your arm. I'm not going to coerce you. I'm not going to promise you something that won't be delivered. I'm not going to do any of that kind of stuff. I'm not going to out-argue your intellectuals. It's not that kind of thing. It's a spiritual thing. It's between you and Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you about it and trust the Holy Spirit is going to come and share with you the genuine truth. And then I pray for your wisdom to receive that genuine truth. Generally speaking, how long is an invitation here? A verse or two. Why? I'll tell you why. I'm not going to beg you to accept Jesus Christ. I'm going to present him to you. And I'm going to trust that the Holy Spirit is going to do what he's going to do. And if it doesn't have to come down this aisle, many times at the back of the church or another day somebody calls me and we go then. But listen, the invitation is open until we quit breathing. Amen? But don't wait too long. Because you miss out on the opportunity to use the gifts God's given you. Join his kingdom as soon as possible. I've already said it, so I don't have to say that during the invitation. Let me tell you what the message of the cross is. The message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction. The people that hear about the word of Jesus and they don't want to listen, they've got their ears, their fingers in their ears, and they go, la, 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 la. You know, you ever done that before? Fingers in your ears, la, la, la. So nobody can tell anything. Their brain is going a thousand miles an hour saying, I'm doing this. Nobody can tell me I'm wrong and all that kind of stuff. It says it's foolishness. And somebody says, do you follow that Bible, that old book? I'll tell you what's interesting about this old book. It's been shot at from more directions than any other one you'll ever see. And yet it's still the best seller. It's not advertised because it's not advertised that makes it a best seller. It still holds together. It's been through many different interpretations, but the words never changed. The truth of it's never changed. It's still here. Amen? It's still here. It says that message is foolish to those others who are headed for destruction. But we who are being saved, when we were saved when we accepted Jesus. We're being saved from who we used to be and more and more useful for God. And we shall be saved according to God's word. Amen? All that's happened to, to us being saved. It's the very power. It's the truth of the message. It's what brought us from being dead and on death row to, to eternal destruction to life and eternal life in Jesus Christ. It is the power, the good news. How many of us can tell people Jesus is the answer? How smart you got to be? You don't have to be smart, you need to be wise. <laughs> you see the difference? I want to show you what happened. I want to show you what happened. It happened to the church across the way in Ephesus. We're going to go through this, this very fast. In Revelation, it talked about the, the, uh, the messenger to the church in Ephesus. He says, I want to tell you all something. He says, I know all the things you do. Jesus knows about this church. He knows what we do right. We did some things right here. We do some things that are kind of, people say, why did you do it that way? Because it's made up of imperfect people. Right? Who have distinct personalities. And, and, and it will never be perfect. So we put up with each other. What do you call that when you keep putting up with each other because you value their relationship more than their rightness or wrongness? What, there's a word for that. Love. Okay? I know what you do. I've seen your hard work, your patient endurance that's putting up with each other and all the life around us. I know you don't tolerate evil people. Listen, you can't play with evil. You can rescue people from it, but don't play with it. Don't, don't try to appease it. It doesn't get it. You can't appease a bully. He'll be back the next day for twice as much. Okay? You have examined the claims of those who say they're apostles and not, and you've discovered they're liars. You patiently suffered from me. You put up with things. You're doing this right, he said. But I still got this one complaint against you. You don't love each other like you used to. Suddenly, it's more about being correct in everything that people do than loving one another and keeping our, what? Unity. Keeping our witness strong. 
I can tell you, if you're living in ways that tarnish the name of God, stop it. Just, just stop it because nobody's going to listen. And, and more people, you're pushing people away from the cross. And, and, and I say that to say, Lord, we, we need to what? Everything we can do, how we love one another, how we live, how we follow this, we don't do it because we're scared of death. Excuse me, damnation. We do it because we, we're scared of other people's damnation. We're scared they're not going to believe our words. Amen? Let me tell you, we can do everything correctly. You can have a silver-tongued devil who never messed up a word when he was reading or anything like that. What does the Bible say about that? It says, if I could speak all the languages of the earth and angels, but didn't love others, I'd only be a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. It'd just be a noise maker. If I had the gift of prophecy and understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, that's intelligence, and I had such faith that I could move mountains, I could do miracles and all that, but if I didn't love others, it would be nothing. It would be nothing. And if I gave everything that I had to the poor, just good work after good work after good work, sacrifice my body and can brag about it to everybody, boast about it, and I didn't love others, it meant nothing. Amen? Well, let me see. How many perfect people got who can do all of this stuff? It wouldn't matter. It would mean nothing. How many imperfect people got here who can love others in spite of them? Who can love Jesus so much that we say no to the things that make human sense but don't go along with his manual? Right? How many of us love enough to treat him like Lord? How many of us are wise enough to say, Jesus, I want you and your way. Because you love me so much and I want to learn to love that way. And I want <clears throat> this time of vacation Bible school for this to be a healthy church. Let me, let me just quote an old movie. I don't know nothing about burning no babies. How many of y'all got that in English? Okay. I don't know nothing, but I do know this. In the old westerns, the first thing they tell the man to do is go and do what? You might remember? Boil water. I don't know nothing about birth and no babies, but the best I can figure about boiling water is you're trying to make it a clean place for that baby to be. Right? That's about our earth, or just trying to get the man out of the way. One or the other. Okay? But, but I know when, when there's surgery, they want that surgery room to be very clean and all that. Listen. It's harvest time. For the Lord. More people to be with Him. Farmers, when do you start? Rice farmers, get your, 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 your field ready in the winter. When, when do you start? Getting the levees done and, and, and start getting things leveled and, and make sure everything's right. Do you ever stop? But, but there's an official time that you really say we're at. The tractors are running all that kind of stuff. And then you get it all ready and you get it set up and you, you flood it when you're supposed to and you, you put the rice in it and all that kind of stuff. And then you, you start switching on and off and whatever it is that y'all do, you do a good job because it's beautiful out there when you see that, that bright green rice out there. And then what happens when it starts to turn yellow and the heads are about this big and the stalks start to fall over because you've done such an amazing job. And it gets right at that time. How many of you at that point when you got your combine ready and everything, invite all your friends with four wheelers to come out and play in the mud on your rice that's ready to be harvested? Would that be crazy? Wouldn't it be horrible for us loving for a year? Children up close, and then right before it happens, let the enemy come in and attack us through divisions and lose the harvest. Wouldn't it be crazy? Wouldn't it be crazy to live a life of loving Jesus and have somebody that made us mad or this didn't go right or that didn't go right and, and, and suddenly throw our whole witness away so that we won't be useful to the Lord. Throw the whole harvest away. Church, how important is it that we get this thing right? The loving each other part. is so important. That's the equipping that I want us to have today. Don't let stuff that's correct or incorrect in the world's eyes ever slow you down from being correct in whose eyes. And what did he say to the church in Ephesus? You can do everything else right, wrong, or right, but if you don't love one another, what good did it do? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. If you've never made Jesus Lord of your life, you know you did that today, that's the invitation. If you've made Him Lord of your life and you've let other things blind you, 
You've got other opinions than his because you don't trust him. You can say today, Jesus, I'm not going to do that anymore. It makes an eternal difference that I get this love thing with you and with my neighbor right. That's the invitation. So let's go to the Lord and pray. We're going to sing Amazing Grace as we close.